Welcome to Interesting People. My name's Tom Lorenzen, and I'm the host of this show. And it's produced under the auspices of the Chabot Los Positas Community College District in Hayward, California. The premise of the show is that there are interesting people everywhere, in everybody's family, community, neighborhood, and one doesn't have to be famous to be interesting, of course. And uh, today I have a special guest, uh, Dr. Ephraim Engelman, uh, who is certainly one of the most interesting persons I think I've ever had a chance to get to know in my life. He personifies what I believe is the best of what I call the art of life. He is about the pursuit of a good life, as the Greeks said, one with meaning and with length. He has excelled in both and continues to add to these elements with, a, with an impressive life. The centerpieces of his life, other than his wife and family, have been medicine and music. Humor, I dare, dare say, is also a part of his essence. As a five-year-old child, he was identified as, as being gifted, possessing genius-like qualities. He was placed into a group of other exceptional children to be studied for their capabilities and performances in life, which was being done at Stanford University. He continues to be monitored in this classic study of human behavior and human potential. In medicine, he became and remains an internationally respected leader in the study and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. His awards and achievements are numerous. A few are shared, Medal of Honor from the University of California at San Francisco, Gold Medal from the American College of Rheumatology, Gold Medal from the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University, where he attended medical school. He was former president of the American Rheumatoid Association, and he is also an honorary member of rheumatology associations in six nations, including China. In music, his mother wanted him to become a violinist. Responding to her wish, he learned to read music before he could read words. As a child, he heard the great violinist Yasha Heifetz perform, and as good a role model as there was from which to emulate with one's own talent on the violin. He didn't simply play the violin, however, he became a prodigy. He performed for many years, both publicly and privately. He also continues to practice, taking each time each day to continue with his talent. Music, however, would not become his primary profession. It would be in medicine, where he has helped tens of thousands of patients directly during his medical career and millions indirectly through his leadership on research on this painful disease. He has also written a fascinating book called My Century. That title indicates something else about our guest today. He still works three days a week, sees patients, patients on occasion, and heads up a major research center for arthritis, and is one of, if not the oldest, practicing physicians in San Francisco, indeed, in the country, and maybe even in the world. I recently had the privilege of attending a birthday party hosted for him as he turned 104 years old. He sang for us that night. He, he keeps young. My guest today is Dr. Ephraim Engelman. Dr. Engelman, thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure. <clears throat> We've got a lot to talk about. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get started a little bit. Tell, tell the audience and myself a little bit about your family. Where did your family come when they originate from when they came to the United States? Well, my mother was born in New York. <clears throat> Although her, her parents came from either Poland or, or Russia, I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, my father came to the United States when he was uh, around 14 or 15 years old. And he came from either Poland or Russia. I don't know where from. I see. Uh, <clears throat> they both came to, uh, to California. You know, I don't know why. Uh, I, I can't, eh, I don't know. But they did. They came to San Francisco. <clears throat> and um, I, I, the story I'm told is that uh, during, during the earthquake, or immediately after the earthquake, they were all in the Golden Gate Park. And my uh, <clears throat> father went to drink some water from a faucet. And he was almost shot dead because that was a no-no. Yeah. 
And then they moved to San Jose, which is where I was born. San Jose, 1911. Right? Oh, that's when I was born. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, population about, what, 20,000 maybe? Yeah, so what was San Jose like during that period of time? That was largely agricultural, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <clears throat> it was a lovely town and had a remarkably large uh, Chinatown. Oh, it did? Yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but obviously a lot of Chinese came to San Jose. But it was a lovely town, and we were surrounded by orchards, and there was a famous the Blossom Festival that always occurred in the spring. And of course, that's now all replaced by houses and people and cities. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I didn't know there was a Chinatown. That Does that still exist in San Jose? Oh, Do you have any... I, I don't know. I'm sure it does. Oh, interesting. At the age of five, uh, Dr. Engelman, uh, I read in your book and have heard you reference about being brought into this study at Stanford University by Dr. Lewis Terman, right. and it was called the Gene Genetic Study of Genius. And the focus was to help us better understand intellectually gifted children. I was not one of them, so. <laughs> uh, the study was being done by Dr. Terman, and the year you were brought in was 1916. Tell us about that program and well, how you I, were brought I, into it. I don't know much about it, and I don't know how they happened to interview me, but uh, apparently, after an interview, I was uh, declared to have a remarkably high IQ, mm -hmm. which is a term and a study conducted by uh, Dr. Terman of Stanford University. Uh, I have heard since then that these IQs are overrated, so um, you can take it for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they're overrated for my case anyway, <laughs> but I'm sure they're not for you, uh, no, Dr. Engelman. That's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> now, you started practicing the violin from the time you were a little kid. Oh, yeah. And my my mother wanted to make a violinist out of me, and I remember uh, sitting on a potty <laughs> when I was, I don't know how old, young. And uh, I learned to read music before I could read the English language. <clears throat> and your first instrument, you said, uh, apparently may have come from your dad, who he had a, did he have a pawn shop? Yes, he did. My, mother, my father had a pawn shop in San Jose. And um, he had all kinds of things in, in the <laughs> store, including a violin, uh -huh. which wasn't a very great violin, but it was a violin. And uh, my mother started, well, she started uh, printing music, as I say, before I could read the English language. Mm -hmm. So I had a very ambitious mother. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us a little bit about her. Oh, what was she like? She was a wonderful lady, and she took such pains of developing her only son at the time. And um, I don't know, I owe a great deal to my mother, I really do. Now, did she want you to become a professional violinist? Yes. Yeah, like in an orchestra? Oh, no, 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 a soloist. A soloist? Yeah, you know, like Heifetz. Oh, wow, <laughs> she did have high ambitions. Oh, you bet she did. And you recall seeing Yasa Heifetz perform at one time in, in San Francisco? Was that where you saw No, in San Jose. In San Jose. He performed, uh, no, excuse me, it wasn't Heifetz. It was Fritz Chrysler. Oh, okay. Uh, who was also a great violinist, uh, who performed in San Jose. I remember very well I went to hear him. Oh, I think I must have been around five or six years old. And speaking of violinists, you know, so many of them now shake around while they're <laughs> playing. Christ, I just stood there and played. Uh -huh. Quite a difference. So what was it that uh, you enjoyed about the violin then? Uh, most kids, like kids, don't like enjoy practicing, and you still practice, I understand. What oh, yes, I have, uh, we have chamber music sessions every week that's, that's... at home. Um, uh, but let me tell you about a concert in which I performed when I was about six or seven years old. Um, while I was playing, a string broke, violin string. Uh -huh. There are four strings on a uh, 
And, uh, but I continued playing. And, and it hit the newspaper, the San Jose Mercury Hour. Uh, I was a, some kind of a genius that I was able to play with just three strings. And so I was considered to be a virtuoso. <laughs> so based on that, my mother brought me to the concertmaster of a San Francisco symphony to, you know, to see how great I really was. <laughs> well, I wasn't that great. <laughs> and uh, so following that uh, visit, with the concert master, my mother realized that maybe I wasn't going to be a, a great solo violinist. But you continued with your violin, and then apparently, from what I understand and reading your book, music was your maybe your first real passion in life. Is that? Uh, a yes, I think that's a reasonable statement. Yes, um, I think it was, and. Um, I don't know whether you want me to talk about this now or not, but when I graduated from high school, San Jose High School, um, a new theater was opening, uh, Fox California Theater. And um, there, it was, a, this was, this was in the days of silent movies. And uh, <clears throat> so they needed, they were gonna have an orchestra mm -hmm. play in the pit. And uh, they needed a, a, vi a local violinist uh, who belonged to the union. And, this, well, I don't know why, but anyway, they approached my parents to see if, um, if they would be willing to let me join the union <laughs> so I could play in the orchestra. Well, to make a long story short, they did. And I went part-time to school at the same time. But... <clears throat> I played in the orchestra, uh, and uh, during these silent movies, and then after the silent movie, there was always a, some sort of a vaudeville show on stage, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I did this for almost for about five years, five between five, five and six years, and during the latter years, well, like. The, the director of the orchestra was a very short guy, and I was a very tall guy. And, um, and we did little comedy bits, gigs. And after, what, two or three years, I became the conductor. <laughs> and um, had a great time doing it. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. No, but, that's fascinating. Uh, uh, anyway. Did did uh, did so you saw a number of vaudeville acts perform? Oh yeah, yeah. Were there any n big name entertainers that yeah, came that later? Yeah, there was a famous um, Peabody. What was his name? He was a famous banjo player. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he was considered to be one of the world's great banjo players. And I guess there were others. I remember one very attractive woman who was about. Uh, 10 or 20 years older than I, who uh, invited me up to her hotel room. Oh. <laughs> uh, but nothing, nothing went. <laughs> I uh, came out of it safe and sound. <laughs> Still a virgin. <laughs> so, uh, did you have ambitions that time to make a career in music? And, and you became a bit of a comic, too, you said. Yeah, I did have it, and I thought I was going to remain in show business. But then um, a guy by the name of Al Jolson made a, a sound movie, and it was obvious that silent movies were out, and we were now gonna have um, movies with sound and voice and so forth. So I decided, the heck with that, I'll get out of uh, this business and go somewhere else. So the, the talkies ended your show business career formally then, and... Uh, I went to Stanford. Okay, and that's what we're going to do, because we're going to take a uh, short break here for a public service announcement, and then we're going to move on to Stanford. Great. Okay. <laughs> it started out like a totally normal day. <laughs> I love you. I mean, I guess I was a little sweaty, and I was definitely sore. <gasps> I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. 
Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. Find out more from the American Heart Association at GoRedForWomen.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. Um, my name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of the show, and my guest today is Dr. Ephraim Engelman at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Engelman uh, is a man of truth and accuracy. That's why he's been a great physician for many years. So I'm going to make a correction, a couple of things that I said where I was not accurate in the first uh, 15 minutes of our discussion. One was the study that uh, he did, uh, which was on a, the broader aspects of arthritis, not just rheumatoid arthritis. Is that correct, Dr. Engelman? Yes. Okay, so I wanted to correct that. And the other thing was he was the past president of the American College of Rheumatology. And uh, I would just like to get those facts right because that's what good doctors do. <laughs> so I've been, we're, now we're ready to go on with the rest of our conversation, uh, Dr. Engelman. We've talked about your family and growing up in San Jose. And when we took our break, then we started to go into, you start to go to Stanford University. Now tell us about going to Stanford. It was 1931, I understand. Ah, uh, that's correct. <clears throat> Well, I was a big shot at Stanford because <laughs> I had just come from professional theater. Uh -huh. And um, so I did all kinds of things. I, one of the main things I did was to head up the, and direct the big game deities at the uh -huh. annual event at Stanford. It still is. But this was in 19, I guess 1931 or 32. Um, Oh, and I did all kinds of stuff. I'm reading stuff here from the book uh, about things that I did at, at, at Stanford. Um, now, now, that big game, is that the one between UC Berkeley and Stanford? Is that the, the Gates in conjunction with that big game? I didn't know where to get UC Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to UC Berkeley. Okay. I just went to Stanford. Yeah, sorry. Go. And um, I did... Uh, I, I don't know, I did all kinds of things at Stanford. Uh, some of them were flops, but many of them were big successes, and I was a big shot on campus. And, and as a matter of fact, I've just been declared the lone survivor of the class of 1933 at Stanford. What did you major in when you went to Stanford then? I became pre-med. You became pre-med? Yeah. How did you get interested in, in medicine? You were a violinist and a musician yeah, I know. and an entertainer. <laughs> I think it was my, partially my parents' idea. Oh. If I can't be a great musician, I can be a great doctor. <laughs> and that indeed you've become. <laughs> and um, I, uh, there was a lady on campus, what was her name? I can't think of her name right now, oh. who entertained uh, Stanford male students every Friday night. And uh, <clears throat> I we were about eight or nine of, of us, and she took a liking to me, so she invited me every Friday night for dinner. I mention this because my uh, grades, although I had very good high school grades, my grades at, at Stanford were not good. And I knew that I could not get into the Stanford Medical School or even the UC Medical School. Mm -hmm. I have never been told this, but I'm sure that this lady had given a lot of money to Columbia. I've never been told this for sure, but I'm quite certain that she must have used her influence to get me into Columbia. Uh, medical school. That was the lady, she was related to the Levi Strauss Company, was that? Yeah, yes. What was her name? Maybe you know uh, from my book. I don't have it in my notes. I know it's in your book. But, yeah. but so she helped you then get into Columbia Medical School, which is one of the I, top... I think so. She never told me that. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, and as I have already said, apparently... I am the lone survivor of the class of 33 mm -hmm. at Stanford. Now you go, into, you go to Columbia then, so you're in New York City. Yeah. So th three or four years of medical school then right. in, at right. Columbia? That's correct. I did not do very well at my med. 
particularly in the first year or two. But I was saved by my violin. The professor of pathology, a fellow by the name of Smetna, Hans Smetna, who was a very fine pianist. He and I did some violin piano sonatas while at, at the Columbia. And I'm sure that's what saved me the first year at the Columbia Middle School. Um, and we played sonatas. By the way, Hans Smetna is the nephew of a famous Smetna who wrote uh, operas in Czechoslovakia. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, in the third, later in the third and fourth years, I did pretty well in medicine. And it's sort of a para paradox that later on, much later, many, many years later, uh, the medical school honor gave me a gold medal for my medical achievements. Yes, now I've seen it on the wall here in your office. Yeah. So once again, music and medicine went together for you, and music helped you in your medical career. That's right. Now, you were originally going to be a, 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 a practicing clinician, and you ended up going into pathology then because of this? Not pathology, rheumatology. Rheumatology, okay. When I graduated from medical school, I did my internship at Mount Zion Hospital. And, um, and I was promised by uh, most of the senior physicians at Mount Zion that I would be next year's resident physician. Mm -hmm. However, the chief guy decided that I would not be the resident in uh, medicine at Mount Zion. And so I took a job in pathology at Mount Zion. And I wrote a paper called Cancer of the Pancreas based on, on uh, previous deaths uh, due to cancer of the pancreas. And at a meeting later on, when I presented this paper, the guy who turned me down to go to UC or to become a resident mm -hmm. uh, welcomed me into UC San Francisco. And that's how I uh, became a resident at UC San Francisco. Now, I don't know why I'm telling you all this, except that the first paper I ever wrote was cancer of the pancreas. And, and that, I understand, was a uh, sort of ended up becoming a benchmark, didn't it, to identify blood yes. in the stool relevant yeah. to potentially pancreatic cancer? That's right. Yeah. So that's why it was an important paper at that time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now I understand then when you're at uh, Mount Zion then that you went on a blind date. Uh, Yes, I did. And uh, ha now, how did this blind date come about, and where this lady come from? <laughs> um, let's see now. There, there was a lady. Uh, what was Marj Marjorie? Marjorie? Uh, what was? Her name? Can't think of That's okay. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Asked this girl, uh, Jean Sinton. Uh, whom there was going to be a a a, a fundraising uh, dance event, uh, raising money for some charity mm -hmm. at the Fairmont Hotel, and she asked Jean whom she'd like to have as a, a date to go to this thing, and uh, and Jean said, "I don't care. They're all my cousins." And, <laughs> And so Marjorie said, well, do you mind if we invite uh, somebody else? And she said, no, come on. And that's how it happened. And I, um, I called for her at Marjorie's house. And they asked me if I'd like to have a drink, and I said no. They asked me if I'd like to have a cigarette, and I said no. So uh, they thought I was an athlete, <laughs> which I certainly wasn't. <laughs> Anyway, then we went to this dance, and we danced, and we danced, and that's how I met Jean. And we have been loving, a loving couple now for some 74 years. That's fantastic. Yes, it is. So did, as soon as you met, did both of you say, wow, this is the guy and gal for me? Was it that quick? That's right. We, 
I courted Jean for about two years uh-huh. until her father called her father, who was a, an attorney, called me to his office. And wanted to know if I was serious about Jean. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Are you kidding? You bet I'm serious." And so that's, and then we got married. Well, I had the privilege of meeting Jean, and what a charming lady. Oh, and I know she's a little younger than you, so... Uh, well, she's 99. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> How well, charming and beautiful. Yes, you're and, right. And highly intelligent, obviously, as oh, well. Yes. Well, during this period of time, then, you went to the Pratt Diagnostic Hospital in Boston. Yes. And uh, you were there, and then you heard about a training fellowship yeah, at, I, at Har- with Harvard at the yeah, Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital. Tell uh, us how that came about. Well, I heard a talk by a man named Walter Bauer, who was one of two people in the United States who were leading research into people who had arthritis. And I, I was attracted by that. And... Um, I didn't think I had a chance of getting the, the fellowship with him because he had many, many applicants. But I, I took a chance. I said I'd go over. And <clears throat> while I was being interviewed by uh, Dr. Bauer, somebody came in and said, Dr. Bauer, we're about to make award rounds. And so he asked me if I'd like to come along. And I said, of course. So we were making hard uh, ward rounds on people with arthritis. And we came upon a, a woman who had arthritis, but also had heart disease. And um, they had an instrument with which they could, and she had a heart murmur. And they had an instrument with which they could measure the number of cycles that uh, this murmur uh, emitted. And uh, I said to Dr. Bauer, and they were doing taking tests. I said, I don't need that. I have perfect pitch. I know exactly what the note is and how many vibrations it emits. He said, well, you don't have to be interviewed anymore. You've got the job. That's fascinating. And that's the way I became a rheumatologist. Now on that, is there a possibility that there's some correlation between music and the heart? I know now women, when they're pregnant, sometimes play uh, Mozart music, yeah. classical music. And is there something, some relevance here? Because music and, and medicine has been the centerpiece of your life, other than Jean, of course. <laughs> um. I don't know. Like, I don't think I can answer that. Question. Okay, okay. Just speculation yeah. then, on my part. At that period of time, so this is then uh, mid to late 1930s, I would think? Uh, this is uh, 1941, to be oh, exact. Okay. Uh, what, yeah. And what was it like then, the knowledge of arthritis and the treatment of arthritis? In your book, you reference that it was pretty unsophisticated. And what was it like, uh, what you saw at that time? Um, I don't know if I understand your question. So let me say something that I think is important. Sure. <clears throat> uh, when Pearl Harbor was, in, you know, when FDR came on uh-huh. and announced Pearl Harbor, in those days there was a great deal of patriotism. And uh, everybody volunteered to, to, to enter the service. And so I volunteered, and I became a lieutenant in the uh, medical corps. Uh-huh. <clears throat> I was the first assigned to a hospital in Fresno. Um, and uh, the medical chief there was a wonderful guy. He promoted everybody. He made me immediately a major. <laughs> and uh, and finally, Washington caught up with this guy and moved him away. But then I was transferred to Palm Springs, 
where I often say that I fought the Battle of Palm Springs. And the reason for that is that uh, the Army had declared, uh, had created a rheumatic fever center. And because of my background with Walter Bauer, who, by the way, was a, uh, a consultant to the Surgeon General, because of that, I became the head of this uh, rheumatic disease group. So that soldiers from all over the world were sent uh, to the center in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there for three years. And you protected Palm Springs very safely during the war then, yes, too. Yes, I it, did. It was never attacked. <laughs> and those days, Palm Springs was a little place of about uh, 2,000. Wow. And mostly Indians, American mm -hmm. Indians. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Dr. Engelman, we're going to take a brief pause here for a uh, public service announcement again, and then we're going to come back to our discussion a little bit further. Please have a seat. I'll be honest. Your resume is not what I'm used to. I know. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need a hard worker. Good. I've got two part-time jobs and to help my parents pay the bills. I need problem-solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find, cultivate, and train a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of the show, and my guest today is Dr. Ephraim Engelman at the University of California at San Francisco. Uh, a, one of the top leaders in the study and treatment of arthritis in the United States and indeed in the world. Uh, Dr. Engelman, when we were talking earlier, the, uh, in the knowledge of arthritis, and with that, the treatment of arthritis, when you entered the field, apparently there was an insufficient lack of knowledge, and a lot of doctors were not trained or knowledgeable about uh, arthritis. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, yes. that, and then what you attempted to try and do from there? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many people remember Rosalind Russell, who was a very famous uh, stage and screen actress. And in the 1950s, she developed very severe arthritis and was frustrated because she couldn't find doctors who knew much about arthritis. Mm -hmm. And so she successfully lobbied Congress uh, to pass legislation that would uh, uh, increase education and research in the field. Uh, and the National Arthritis Act was passed and signed by President Ford, I think, in 1970 or 71. I think it was 76, 75, around there, yeah. Your memory's better than mine. <laughs> Only on some things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and so a commission was appointed to look into this matter and make recommendations. For ver various reasons, I was the chairman of this commission, and uh, Rosalind Russell was a public member of the commission. Mm -hmm. These commissions often have uh, one or two public members. Anyway, we made recommendations, and many, many of which were implemented. Uh, one of which, for example, was creating a National Arthritis Institute, of which there had been none. And uh, <clears throat> when Rosalind died, the Congress decided there should be a Center for Research in Arthritis somewhere in the country. And after competition, uh, it became to UCSF. And I was made the director of it, and I've been the director of it ever since. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's an incredible story, Dr. Engelman. And, uh, you know, in that too, when you came back to the Bay Area after the war, you opened a practice here. And my understanding is you were the only specialist in this whole area of arthritis, rheumatoid, in Northern California. That's right. So there was a tremendous lack of knowledge and expertise uh, right. to help people. Is it about 10% I read that of the people come down with some form of arthritis? Yes, that's about right. And it's the commonest disabling disease among the elderly. It is. Oh, yeah. Now, in terms of uh, dealing with, trying to deal with this disease, I know in your book you also wrote that uh, if going into a hospital you'd see a lot of people on crutches and wheelchairs and they were immobilized, they were in a lot of pain. The treatments were aspirin, a few other things, yeah. but not much. Then in 1949, you said you were attending a conference in New York yeah. and a breakthrough occurred. Yeah. That was cortisone. Tell us about that. Oh, that was the most dramatic event. It was a meeting in New York of uh, international ph physicians interested in, in arthritis. And it was at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, I'll never forget it. And a man by the name of Phil Hench of the Mayo Clinic, who incidentally had a cleft palate and it was difficult to understand, showed a movie of a woman uh, trying to get up from a chair and couldn't because of her severe arthritis. And after an injection of cortisone, uh, 24 hours later, she was able to get up. And it was a most remarkable uh, event. We thought we had a cure, uh, but it, it was the most remarkable event. And that is the beginning of a new era in the treatment of arthritis. So cortisone was the first major breakthrough, but then they found that the ramifications well, brought uh, problems? Well, of course. There were problems because of, we were using doses that were much too big, and it would cause all kinds of serious side effects. So much so that Phil Hench, who, who himself had diabetes, neglected his, he became depressed because of all these terrible things that seemed to happen with the people who were taking cortisone. And he himself essentially ignored his treatment of his diabetes and died. He virtually committed suicide wow. because of this. And of course, we've since learned that uh, the doses of cortisone have to be much smaller. So cortisone is still used, but in much smaller doses. Oh, yes. In those days, it was injectable. Now we have oral tablets. I see. Now, there are two other major advances, or three, that you referenced. Uh, one is, I can't, if I pronounce it correctly, methotrexate? Methotrexate, yes. And it's, what is that? Is that a... It's uh, a drug that was um, used. You know, I'm not sure. I... Uh, my recollection is that it was originally used by some physicians up in northern, uh, up in uh, Washington. I see. Yeah. But it's very effective in uh, certain types of arthritis. Certain types, I see. And then you use a term called biologics. What is that? Biologics. What is that? Well, biologics are micros microscopic uh, molecules that um, drugs that attack um, molecules that attack the joints. Oh. And uh, it's a whole group of them. Oh, there, there must be a dozen of them now that are very effective. And, and I, I think the point to be made is that when I was getting my training, we saw people, patients, in gurneys and wheelchairs. We don't see that anymore. 
were able to give uh, these patients remarkable relief so that we don't see uh, wheelchairs. We don't cure them, but uh, while they're on these drugs, they do remarkably well. Some of them obviously have side effects. Yeah. You also referenced uh, uh, joint replacements also oh, came yeah. in. That was the added. Orthopedics have made a remarkable contribution with joint replacements. Yeah. Yeah. So people now with severe arthritis are more able to be more functional and less pain, but they're still discomfort and pain. Well, with it. no, we're, it. we're able to relieve them pretty much of pain uh, and make the, we make them functional, uh, not only due to medicine, but also by our orthopedic friends. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand in 1961, you became head of the National Associ Association for Arthritis, I believe, or Rheumatoid Arthritis. And no. No? No. I've got to get it right now. <laughs> in 19, what are you saying? About 1961, you became president of uh, an association on arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. I, I, maybe you're referring to the International League okay. Against Rheumatism, ILAR. Okay. Uh, which was a uh, uh, confederation of 40 countries. I see. And I did become president of that. Okay. Was that in 61? I'm not sure. Somewhere around there. <laughs> I know you became a lead advocate of, it says, more vigorous teaching of arthritis and rheumatology to medical students. Oh, yes. Because they, apparently prior to then, they were not taught this uh, to any great extent. That's correct. So now... Is this a, a part of basic curriculum in medical schools now? Oh, yes, yes. I, I think there's no question about that. It becomes a major part of uh, medical school instruction, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and when you came here to the University of California, San Francisco, uh, the uh, medical uh, treatments here, that it went through a major transformation in the 60s and 70s. Oh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened here? Because University of California and San Francisco Medical Center is now one of the preeminent ones in the country and the world, and you were here at that time when yes, this changed. Yes, I had the, obviously had the advantage of having been trained in Boston by Dr. Walter Power. So when I came to San Francisco, after the war, mm -hmm. I came to San Francisco and I was uh, became the head of the arthritis clinic at UCSF. And while uh, they were using uh, mostly aspirin in the treatment of, the, of uh, joint disease, I was able to introduce new forms of treatment and it was sort of a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I would dare say, uh, because I'm sure Virtually all of us have had relatives and loved ones uh, yes. suffer from uh, arthritis right. and uh, and <clears throat> in the... Perhaps, uh, maybe I should say at this time, that when Martha Russell died, as I think I said, hmm. when she died, the Congress decided there should be a center, and uh, we got it here. <clears throat> and up until uh, very recently, it was called the Rosalind Russell Medical Research Center for Arthritis at UCSF. And I am uh, very happy and immodest to say <laughs> that a couple of years ago, the name of our center has been changed. It's now the Rosalind Russell Ephraim Engelman Center for Research. Well, that's one of the most appropriate things I think has ever been done. <laughs> I, I think that is a, a title that certainly belongs there. Now with Rosalind Russell, because she was a w famous actress and entertainer, played Broadway and, and movies, when she came down with arthritis, was she the first figure that really was able to put this on the national radar? Oh, I think so. It was she who uh, lobbied Congress. Mm -hmm. She was so frustrated that she couldn't find any doctors who knew much. And uh, she and the Arthritis Foundation was a fundraising organization, I joined in lobbying Congress. Um, and I've already so told you what Congress did. Yes, and you, you went with her at times, didn't you? Before, mm. You went with her at times to Congress, right? Oh, yes, and she was in a wheelchair, and I would uh, push her along 
Mm -hmm. I help her uh, interview members of Congress. And then you ended up holding hearings around the country when you were appointed chair yeah. to the I task was, force? I was commission. Yeah. Yeah. We had hearings, oh, I don't know, about eight or nine cities. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, when people knew that Rosalind Russell was going to be there, it was standing room only. Was she able to go to some of the hearings? Oh, yes. Did yes. she? In a wheelchair. In a wheelchair. Wow. Yeah. So she's a, a real oh, key yeah. figure in the whole I don't know, do those pictures show up? We're going to get some pictures, because I know you've got pictures of Rosalind Russell hit behind your desk here, and we're going to get some photographs after we finish the interview so we can show them as well. Good. And uh, with that, Dr. Engelman, we're going to take our another short pause here for a public service announcement, and then All we're going right. to come back to the fourth and last part of this interesting discussion. Thank you. The earthquakes you see in movies are one thing, but real life is a completely different animal. Just because you can't predict an earthquake doesn't mean that you can't prepare for one. In the event of a real earthquake, you should drop, cover, and hold on. Visit ready.gov slash earthquake and practice what to do to keep you and your family safe in the event of a real earthquake. And you'll be seen as a hero by your family and your loved ones. Visit ready.gov slash earthquake today. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of the show, and my guest today is Dr. Ephraim Engelman at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Engelman, as we've been discussing here about your uh, leadership in the research and treatment of arthritis, and through the Rosalind Russell, now Rosalind Russell Ephraim Engelman uh, Medical Center here at UC uh, San Francisco, one of the things that you did too was you helped not only to in increase public awareness and knowledge of doctors in this country, but in other nations around the world. So tell us about what, how this transpired, how you got involved in trying to bring this <clears throat> knowledge to the world. Well, there was an organization created known as the International League Against Rheumatism, ILAR. Uh, and there were 40... Uh, 40 countries that uh, were members of this league. <clears throat> and I, my wife and I visited most of them, so we were very well traveled, especially since the league paid for the transportation. <laughs> but um, one country that stands out in my memory uh, of, uh, concerning our visits is China. Uh, we visited China uh, three times. Now, for some reason, I never was able to find out uh, the Chinese autocracy, the government, uh, denied that there was any problem uh, with arthritis in the country. Hmm. And um, so we made, uh, as I say, three visits. And on the third visit, after visiting the members of the Chinese government, they finally allowed uh, uh, recognized that arthritis was a problem in China. And so, um, later, about a year later, they had the first meeting of the Chinese Society of Rheumatology, to which I was invited. That was my fourth visit to China. And I I've always considered that to be one of my great achievements, huh. encouraging the Chinese to have their own a society for rheumatology. So Chinese medicine now has done what you helped to do here in this country, and that's to increase knowledge and awareness and treatment capabilities right. for it. Right. I thought I'm very proud of that achievement. Well, I'm sure there's millions of people in China that are very grateful for that <laughs> achievement, too, for sure. Uh, so... Was the United States, through Rosalind Russell and yourself, were you, were the United States in the forefront of elevating arthritis on the radar screen, or were there any other nations that were oh, doing Oh, yeah. Well, no, I think England made some very important advances. I would say, generally speaking, that it was uh, England and the United States that were the national leaders mm -hmm. uh, in the study and research treatment of uh, arthritis. I see. 
Well, Dr. Engelman, I know you're a young man, you're 104 and still keeping young. And I know the audience out there is going to have some questions or about how do you keep young? And uh, I know in your book here, you have 10 items and uh, which I'm gonna ask you if you'd like to read them. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes ten. they're a little bit facetious, but they're all interesting and are worth hearing. So all I'll right, give this to you and if you'd like to read them for our audience. <clears throat> My 10 tips on longevity. First of all, be sure to select parents with the right genes. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that good. I don't know how you do that, but that's good. <laughs> you gotta choose the right spouse. I encourage sex uh, with your wife, that is. <laughs> but ch and children are optional. Optional? Yeah, we've had three. Well, okay. By the way, my kids are interesting, but... Uh, uh, what, did two of them became a doctor, doctors as well, didn't they? Uh, t our two sons that became doctors. Our daughter married a doctor. And uh, we have a grandchild who's a doctor. Uh, but we do have an attorney. <laughs> Uh-oh. Anyway, all right. So uh, enjoy your work, whatever it is, or don't do it. Under no circumstance should you retire voluntarily. And you haven't. I haven't. <laughs> exercise is overrated, I think. Hmm. Exercise if you must. Uh, avoid vitamins, organic foods, fish oil, and other so-called nutrients. Just don't bother with special diets. Just don't weigh yourself. <laughs> Keep your mind active. Have many interests such as music, reading, writing, crossword puzzles, and poker. Seven, avoid travel by air. Travel by car instead. It's much more exciting. Don't fall. Well, that's, a good <laughs> that's a big one. When in doubt, use a cane. Mm -hmm. You'll be amazed how much respect you get when you use a cane. Maybe I'll start using one then. <laughs> <laughs> Avoid heart attacks. Uh -huh. Avoid heart attacks, stroke, cancer, and arthritis. When it's convenient, see a doctor, especially a rheumatologist. <laughs> Finally, be happy and lucky. But most important, you got to keep breathing. <laughs> this is absolutely critical to longevity. Fascinating advice. <laughs> Now, it's interesting, may I ask about vitamins, because vitamins are so popular among most everybody. You, you're skeptical of yeah. the vitamin pill world. Oh, rarely a person may be a short in, a, vi in a vitamin, but generally speaking, people aren't. Now, what about diet? You've said avoid, avoid fads, but... Uh, Tell us a little bit about diet. Any recommendations for people from your perspective? Um, well, seriously, <laughs> and this is not a tip, yes. not, not, but seriously, one should avoid obesity. Uh, I think heavy weight is a real no-no. Um, it's not easy sometimes. People love to eat. But uh, I think that in terms of longevity, uh, obesity is something that really should be avoided. Um, in cer certain people, uh, certain kinds of food are objectionable, but I won't get into that. Sure, okay. Well, to me, one of the most uh, wonderful things, of the, among the many th wonderful things about you, Dr. Engelman, is your attitude towards life. You, uh, you have a great sense of humor. You are in show business. You're positive about things. Every day you get up and you come to work three days a week. Attitude is, I, it strikes me as something that's been critical to your longevity and to having the great life you've had and many more years to come too. Right? You know, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, what more can I say? Um, life is sweet, and I love it. And if we're lucky, um, 
I'm going to be 105 pretty soon. My wife will be 100, and we will have been uh, married for 75 years. That's uh, We look forward to that event. That's exceptional. Uh, w with your sense of humor, too, and I'm going to bring up uh, an article that was published uh, at Columbia University by their medical school, I believe, by a writer named Peter Wartman. Yeah. And this was done six, seven, eight years ago about you, where, and referenced not only your great medical career and achievements, uh, but also referenced about your sense of humor and referred to you, I believe, res very respectfully as George Burns, but without a cigar. Yeah, exactly. And George Burns had a wonderful attitude towards life, and you have a wonderful attitude. And I, you know, so do you look at that? I mean, every day you seem to be positive, even at 104. I know oh, yeah. Absolutely. I'm very pleased with myself. <laughs> well, you should be, too. And as a final note, before we wrap up here, yeah. uh, is there anything else you would like to give advice to? This uh, interview will eventually uh, goes locally here in the Bay Area, and then it goes on YouTube and goes everywhere. Anything you care to share with anybody about anything on arthritis or living a good life? And uh... Oh, I don't know. Uh, just be good. Be kind. Uh, don't get too fat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, enjoy life. It's a wonderful it's a wonderful experience to be alive and to stay alive as long as you can. Well put, Dr. Engelman. As we conclude this wonderful visit, uh, I'd like to say something to you and take the liberty, I believe, of speaking on behalf of certainly tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that you've benefited. But I think more to, uh, indirectly, you talk about going to China, changing uh, public awareness here domestically, you and Rosalind Russell, and others, increasing the knowledge of arthritis, the treatment of arthritis, and then taking it to other countries. China, you reference. Literally, I'm, I dare say you have impacted beneficially millions of people through your career and your life. And I can't think of any greater testimony that can be said to a human being than you've done something to improve the quality of life for millions of people. And that's a tremendous achievement, Dr. Engelman. And you know what? I can't agree with you more. <laughs> well, with that, we're going to end this interview and this discussion. Oh, I'm and, sorry. And I, I'd love to go on. Well, we, 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 maybe we could do this a, a second interview and go on. <laughs> but it's been a wonderful privilege to have you here on our show, Interesting People, and to visit with us. And uh, thank you for everything, sir. Yeah, well, quite well. It's a real privilege to be with you. Come back again. So. I sure will. Thank you. <laughs>